So let's get Johnny Marks on the show. I want to talk to John. There he is. What's going on, my brother? I don't want to talk about the Eagles. I'm, I'm finished. It's <laughs> over. You know, it, it's crazy. I, I just heard you, Bill. It went from zero to 60 in no time where it's like, man, Nick Sirianni, I know they've been struggling, but they started 10 and one and there's injuries. And like, I, I'm not saying that he's not responsible for some of this, but you're not fired. I mean, he went to the Super Bowl last year. And after watching, after watching the Giants game, it feels totally different. I've never seen I've never seen a team not give a shit like that before. An Eagles team. I especially a team that is going to the playoffs. I've seen teams check out. Look, we saw it with Chip Kelly. There was a reason they made the move when they did. He didn't even make it to the end of the season because that team had checked out and rightfully out. so. Chip Kelly's was a horrible human being, a horrible coach to work to play for. But you talk about this team and one of the things that surprises me, John, and welcome to the show, too, John. We're getting right Thank into you. it, talking about the Eagles, man. It's good Thank to see you. I know a lot of people are happy to hear your voice again. They are? Well, hi. Thank you. Yeah, good, So we good had John be, on the show. the show. We had John on the show in the summertime, long time ago. Kind of want to go back and see what the hell we were talking about. I know one of the things we talked about was linebacker, and we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. But what surprises me the most, John, when you talk about it going 0-60 to 60 with Nick Sirianni, is one of the things that I thought, that Sirianni was so good at was building a strong culture. And we thought that this team had an unbelievable ability to overcome adversity. But now that I look back, John, what adversity has this team faced up until this season? They haven't. No, it's a, it's a great point. They really haven't. I, I guess the when they were 2-5 and five and he gave the flower speech, about how, you know, are you watering and are you fertilizing it? And they went on that run. And, I mean, that was the only the only real adversity that, that they had faced. I guess I'm just surprised, and, and I guess I shouldn't be. I've been watching sports long enough. But the culture of this team is already established, right? Like, God, we talked about with Brandon and Fletcher and Jason Kelsey and all the guys that have won Super Bowls here. And you can see, not that those guys aren't great Eagles and not that those guys aren't great leaders, but it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean a damn right now. Um, and I mean, bottom line is with Nick Sirianni, he's the head coach and this team has no answers for anything that's going on right now. I mean, they weren't, they were behind 24 to nothing to the giants in the first half before they pulled their starters in a game where like, yeah, was it, was it likely that the Cowboys were going to lose to Washington? Well, they were down early on in the game. The Cowboys were so the Arizona game where you're playing for everything, you're playing for a number two seed, you're playing for the division. You're at home and you give up 35 points to one of the worst offensive teams in the league and your defense. I mean, you know, the, the Eagles had the ball, I think, three times in the second half and they scored one touchdown because the defense gave up four drives of 70 plus 70 plus yards. But you know what it is, Bill? Like, I don't know exactly where to put my finger. Is it the coaches and the players aren't getting along? Is there a problem in the locker room? Is there a problem with Jalen and A.J. Brown? I thought A.J. Brown's comments about how the players need to believe in the coaches were very telling to me. I don't think these players believe in the coaches. And I don't know I don't know if there's if there's problems in the locker room between the players because teams that fall apart like this that were 10 and 1 and were winning and beating good te good teams, they don't just forget how to win and lose talent. Something internally is going on with this team. I'm convinced and it's major and that's the biggest thing going on right now. Yeah, I look at that defense, and we could talk about that. I think they lack personnel. But when you look at this offense, there is no reason, outside of them not believing in their coaches, outside of bad game plans by Sirianni and Brian Johnson and bad play calling, that this offense shouldn't be dominating for four quarters. You look at this offense on paper, I would put them up against any offense in the NFL. And this is the product they're putting out on the field. The New York Giants – Think, <laughs> and this is what they do in a game that actually matters. The Cowboys were losing at that point in the game, John. Yep. Yeah, yeah. The, the offense, the, the, the like you said with the defense. The defense, I believe, is personnel, and I'm not telling you that it's well coached, but they've tried two coordinators, and it, it, it to me, it's mostly personnel driven on the defense. The offense is puzzling because didn't we talk about how they have a great offensive line and they have multiple running backs and they have great wide receivers and Dallas Goddard and Jalen Hurts. So what exactly is going on? It, 
I mean, the offense is simple. It feels like you know what's coming when when, when they're when they're stalling and they're and and it feels like they need a big down or a big drive. They're relying on Jalen and in designed runs, right? Like you can't do that. That's not what the NFL is. You can do it a little bit. He's not Lamar Jackson. He's not a dynamic runner. We know what he does with the with the tush push and by the goal line, but like he needs to be able to throw the ball. And I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't I don't know. I can't put my finger on what's going on with the offense. Like you had said, Bill, the defense stinks. The defense just, just flat out stinks. They don't have a linebacker. They're not getting into the quarterback. Their young players are underachieving. Their old guys look old. Their secondary stinks. But the offense doesn't make sense. And I don't know why they're struggling. And it wasn't that long ago. Remember the, the Bills game? This is the same Bills team that have won five, five straight games since the Eagles. Jalen's going back and forth with Josh Allen, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. They tie the game on that 59-yard field goal. They win in overtime. Where's that offense? We haven't seen it in a month, month and a half, and it's puzzling. I don't know what it is. And the turnovers, man. The turnovers have been a problem all season all long. You know, they had the offense finishes the year now with 28 turnovers, which is tied for 23rd in the NFL. Last season, they only had 19. Last year, they were a plus eight turnover differential. This year, they finished the season a negative 10. It's amazing that this team won 11 games. It really is. When you look at how bad this defense has been, they're they're worse in the league in almost every single category. The only one they're not in the bottom of the league is rushing defense. But if you look at the last seven games, they yeah. stink against the run, too. But yeah. you, you mentioned something a little while ago. You said that, you know, talking about adversity and, and Nick Sirianni battling adversity, and you cited to his first season where they started out two and five. He gives the flower speech. They end up going on a run and making the playoffs. But the major difference that year, John, there were zero expectations. You had a coach that nobody knew. You had a, a quarterback who was starting his first time ever as a starter. He had played a couple games his rookie season. There were zero expectations. Last year, they didn't have crazy expectations, and they had a pretty easy road. They dominated everybody all the way up until the Super Bowl. And this year, the first time they face adversity is when they got punched in the mouth against the San Francisco 49ers, and they've never been able to recover. And I've had some people say, did the 49ers break this team? Do you see that? Do you think the 49ers broke this team? Remember after the game, uh, some some members of the, the 49ers defense, Bosa was saying, here's the template for beating the Eagles offense. Here's the template for for beating Jalen Hurts. He looks at the rush on every play. He's worried about the rush. And if you if you bring pressure up the middle and you don't let him escape to the middle, he has nowhere to go. And he says, I hope the Cowboys use this. Uh, is that what's happened? I mean, the, Jalen Hurts wouldn't be the first player and the Eagles wouldn't be the first team where defensive coordinators, somebody figured them out. And I'm wondering if Brian Johnson and Nick Sirianni have any answer for it. So it sure as hell doesn't look like they do. Outside of Jalen Hurts making hero plays and then doing the tush push. Remember when the tush push was fun and it was cute? And it was like, oh, the Eagles and the tush push, whatever. They were lining up to do it on Sunday and I was mad. I'm like, damn it, like this can't be the offense. The tush push can't be your – that's not the West Coast offense, the tush push. It's a move to get a yard. But like, I just – I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I, I – I, I mean, Lamar Jackson, after his MVP season, if you look at his numbers, he, they, they went down each year, and he had a problem staying healthy. And he came back this year. He looked like he's going to win the MVP. But there was an adjustment made to, to Lamar Jackson and to what the Ravens offense did, right, to where they said, hey, Lamar, we're not going to let you run around and, and make a thousand, thousand different plays. You're going to have to throw the football, and we're going to hit you. And it feels like they've done the same thing with Jalen Hurts. Last year – and I think it's fair to have felt like this when you watch the, when you watch the Super Bowl. Jalen Hurts was throwing the ball better than Pat Mahomes. I mean, the progress Jalen Hurts made last year throwing the football was amazing. Because I was one of the guys that was like, I don't know if he can throw the ball well enough to be to be a difference making quarterback. Because ultimately, when you get a little bit older and you're not making the same splash plays with your legs, you're going to need to be able to throw the football. I don't need you to get hurt. You don't need to be running the ball ten or fifteen times a game. And he showed last year that he progressed. He Look what he did in the Super Bowl. And you look at it this year, and he's went backwards. I don't know how much of that's coaching. I don't know how much, how much of that is confidence. I don't see confidence in Jalen Hurts. I don't see him throwing with anticipation, 
getting the ball out early. I see Jalen Hurts looking for open receivers, and I see Jalen Hurts kind of thinking through everything instead of just reacting and it being natural. So, I mean, I don't know what you do. If you lose to the Bucs, come back next year with the same coaching staff or the same head coach and the same offensive coordinator. I just don't know how you do it. I don't know how you fix it. And I'm not absolving Jalen Hurts. I think he does need to play better. But what I see is a quarterback that doesn't trust the offensive game plan and is not trusting his offensive coaching staff. And you talk about the blitz. Jalen does need to be better against the blitz, but they're not helping him. With these route designs and this pass protection, they are not helping Jalen Hurts. And you mentioned the San Francisco 49ers team saying that they kind of had the blueprint how to stop this offense. But you look at the last six games, they're only averaging 20 points a game. That's a big drop-off to only be averaging 20 points a game. And on defense, they're giving up 30 points a game in the last six. So it's not a surprise they're five and one, excuse me, one and five in their last six games. And I'm concerned because you look at that Tampa Bay Bucs team, as bad as they are, John, because they're not a good team. They barely beat the Carolina Panthers. Yeah, I just look. I just looked at the last six games, though. Philadelphia Eagles are one and five with a negative 59 point differential and a negative eight turnover differential. In the last six, the Bucs, five and one, plus 38 point differential, plus five turnover differential. Which team do you think is the better team just looking over the last six games? No, I, I don't know why anybody at this point would give the Eagles the benefit of the doubt that, uh, like, against the Cardinals, ah, they're going to be fine. Remember, this started with the Seahawks, and everybody said, ah, they're going to beat the Seahawks. The Seahawks, ah, ah, ah. and I'm like, hey, they haven't won up there in a really long time. It's a tough place to play, and the Eagles managed to find a way to lose that game. Earlier in the season, they were finding a way to, find, find a way to win games. They, were, they found a way to lose that game, and then they beat the Giants, which was a game that was probably a lot closer than it should have been. But that Arizona game, and then you look at the look at the, the Giants game, that they, they, they you have no reason to believe that this team is going to beat the Bucs. Period. Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Baker Mayfield had a good year. I'm not pretending Baker Mayfield is the next coming of a top five elite quarterback. But if this defense plays the way this defense has been playing, if this secondary plays the way this secondary has been playing, if these linebackers can't cover anybody over the middle, it was happening during the Giants game. They're doing simple crossing routes, and there's nobody 10, 15 yards from them, from, from a Giants receiver. It's like, what are they doing? Why are they so soft? Are they missing coverages? So I'm done giving the Eagles the benefit of the doubt. I'm done saying, well, no, the Eagles will beat the Bucs. No, I'm, I'm done with that. I'm, they should. They've given you no reason over the course of the last six weeks to believe that they can beat the Buccaneers. If they do, they do. And I'll say, good, good win. But, man, like, I, I, don't, I don't see them beating – the Cardinals. They couldn't beat the Giants. They were embarrassed against the Giants. The Buccaneers are at least at least they'll show up and give you effort, and they're going to be feisty. This team's not good enough to show up and win on Monday night. I mean, the NFL buried the game on Monday night, eight fifteen. It's the last, it's the, it's probably the worst window that you could have for one of these games. It's because the Eagles stink and the Buccaneers stink. So there you go. You got the stinker of the weekend. Your, our Philadelphia Eagles are playing in the stinker of the weekend. Awesome. I'm surprised they didn't put it on the game that's being streamed only on Peacock. That's what I thought they were. That's what I thought they were going to do. Well, let's talk about this defense, John, because we've talked about it. They're bad. Their personnel is bad. But four games ago, the Philadelphia Eagles make the decision to change their defensive coordinator. We find out yeah. about it on like a Saturday morning from Jay Glazer, which is still blows my mind that there was no announcement made. We had to find out from Jay Glazer about it. But there was an interesting interview last week. Everybody got kind of caught up in the A.J. Brown locker interview. But the next day, Hassan Reddick spoke with the media. And there was a subtle thing he said when he spoke to the media when he was asked about the change from Sean Desai to Matt Patricia. And they asked him about how difficult it was in changing the coordinators this late. And he said, well, the higher-ups thought that this would be a good idea, and us as players need to do a good... But by saying the higher-ups, he didn't say Coach Sirianni. So whose decision was it to really make a desperate move and change defensive coordinators when it's not the coaching, it's the personnel? Yeah, it it was... I mean, 
I, I've always, I always thought it was Howie Roseman. I didn't think Nick Sirianni went to Howie Roseman and said, Hey, we got to make a, we got to make a change. This is something they were probably thinking about doing. And once you had that last, I don't even remember the last game that, that the side was the coordinator in, but yeah, I, I don't believe for a second. I mean, if you remember when Brandon Graham initially after the game, Brandon Graham talked about, well, you know, like the media and the fans and everybody was talking about Sean the sign making a change. So they more or less had to make a change. And I remember thinking, were we really talking about Sean the sign making a change? Because I, I know doing five five days of, of, of talk on sports radio, I'm not telling you that there wasn't talk about Sean the sign. There was more focus on the offense of Brian Johnson than there was on Sean the sign. We know the defense stinks. I thought it was personnel based the whole time. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, beginning of the season. In fact, there was a Twitter poll on the Marks and Reese show. I think 85% of the people were saying, yeah, Sean decides an upgrade over Jonathan Gannon. And my whole thing was, you don't even know who Joe, you don't even know who he was, Sean Desai. Like you, you don't know Sean Desai from Joseph Adai, the uh, the old Colts running back. But like just everybody assumed he's going to be better than Jonathan Gannon because Jonathan Gannon he, he's the reason they lost the Super Bowl. Well, I'm not telling you Jonathan Gannon would have saved the season and this would be a top five defense right now. I think there'd be a better defense than they are right now. But like there's unfortunately with this defense and and talking about they should have brought T.J. Edwards back now, and C.J. G.J. had an interception in his first game back with the Lions. Yeah, like that's all That's all nice to think right now they were going to do it. The bottom line was they used high draft picks on Georgia Bulldog players that are supposed to be making more contributions than they are right now. Nolan Smith's been at zero this year. Jordan Davis, I heard, saw Brian Baldinger was saying that he was he's out of shape and he shouldn't even be playing right now. And it feels like Jalen Carter maybe hit a little bit of a rookie wall here. Um, and then the, the old guys look old. You know, outside of Hassan Reddick, who's the next best defensive player on this team? Well, like Josh Sweat has it at a sack, and it feels like two months. It might be two months. Brandon's probably in his last year, right? Like you're asking you're asking guys to do what they did last year, which they're not able to do it. Hassan Reddick's their best defensive player. Who's their second best player? This is a bad defense. Yeah, it's a it's really a good defense. question. Who is the second best player? And you know, for those who follow the show, no, I've been talking about for weeks that I think the defense is in the state it's in. Because Howie Roseman has swung and missed way too much in the draft on defensive players. It wasn't just the Georgia Bulldog players. If you look back, not including this year, not including the rookie class, because you can't expect rookies to carry your team to a Super Bowl. You look at the last four years before this draft, there's not a single player outside of the D tackle position that is giving you anything, John. They drafted Nicobe Dean. Kyron Johnson. Nicobe Dean's on IR. Kyron Johnson's on the Steelers. They took Zach McPherson, IR. Defensive end, Teron Jackson on the practice squad. Linebacker, Jacoby Stevens, not even in the league. Patrick Johnson finally is getting some defensive snaps. He's more of a special teams guy. The year before that, Davion Taylor out of the league. Kavon Wallace on the Titans. Sean Bradley on IR. Casey Tuhill on the Commanders. You go back to 2019, Sharif Miller out of the league. They have not drafted a defensive player that is contributing to this defense in years. And this is the problem now is Howie Roseman tries to get aftermarket parts and make things work. And it just isn't going to work on a team that has Super Bowl aspirations. Now, you talked about real quick switching to Matt Patricia, though. So they did that after the San Francisco game. And when you said you did that poll about, you know, Sean Desai and people were saying he was better than Jonathan Gannon, as bad as things were, because they weren't great, he did have a good game against the Los Angeles Rams. He did have a good game against the Miami Dolphins. He did have a good second half against the Dallas Cowboys. They completely shut down the Tampa Bay Bucks in week three. Then you make the change to Patricia, and he hasn't gone up against an offense that's better than 19th in the NFL. And they haven't done a damn thing, John. So would you go back to Sean Desai at this point for the playoff run, or are you stuck with Patricia at this point? Yeah, I think you're stuck with Patricia, but looking back at looking back at making the change, and and I guess my reaction at the time was like the Eagles obviously felt like that that something needed to be done. And I mean, if they feel like that Sean Desai is a problem with coaching and scheming and everything else, then yeah, like bringing in a guy like Matt Patricia who has has experience as a Super Bowl winning defensive coordinator makes sense. Reality is that might have been the tipping point of the season. That might that I mean this might this might be this might have been when players were like, what are we doing here? Like 
What are we doing here? Was it because of the sigh? Was it because they made the move from the sigh? I don't know. I didn't hear a lot of players coming out and and uh, and having the sides back or saying the wrong move was made or anything like that. But it really, it just kind of started in motion, just a, a bunch of weirdness. And when, when the, when's the last time a defensive coordinator that late in the season on a team that I guess at the time had two losses or three losses? And like you said, defense wasn't a total train wreck this year. They had their moments. Um, injuries had affected them. But, I mean, if you remember at the trade deadline, remember that there were stories out there that Howie was sniffing around about a, a corner, that, that the corner from the Bears that's set to be a free agent. Uh, there yeah, was, there was also Pat- some talks about Patrick Sertain, Sertain from uh, right. Denver as well. Yeah, Right, agreed. So because the Eagles can't draft and develop a corner, guess what they have to do? It's just they did the same thing with wide receiver. They have to go out and buy one. So he's looking, and I think this is what they do this offseason, he's looking to go out and buy a, a corner and then sign them to a, to a contract. Who's the last corner they drafted? And it, Jalen Mills, and he was a seventh round draft pick for a reason. Off the field stuff, right? They were they got lucky. Back. Yeah, you have to go, go back to Lito or Sheldon Brown when you're talking about a a, a a corner, and that hurts. You can't constantly you can't constantly use duct tape on a roster, and the offense is almost a separate thing right here. But the fact that you you swung and missed, like you had said. Even on some of those guys, if they're contributing players on your roster, you got to hit on one or two of these guys to make an impact. You haven't hit on anybody. Especially in a salary cap era where you're paying a quarterback $200 million, you're paying a wide receiver $100 million, you need young defensive players who are still playing on their rookie deal, the four-year rookie contract. But this is why it infuriates me even more that they let TJ Edwards and Marcus Epps walk. They didn't draft those guys, but those were young players that they actually developed. And you're not good enough at finding young defensive talent that you should let players like that walk out the door, man. That's what I'm so frustrated about with Howie Roseman. Well, look, we started this whole conversation about Nick Sirianni and how surprised we are about the culture, and it looks like this team kind of has given up. And you mentioned a little bit, but knowing Jeffrey Lurie and Howie Roseman, if this team comes out against the Bucks and they lay an egg like what we just saw the last two weeks against the Giants and the Cardinals, is it your opinion that Nick Sirianni is back next season as the head coach? I think it comes down to a conversation that Jeffrey Lurie has, and it's how do we fix this? He says it to Howie Roseman, and he says it to Nick Sirianni. How do we fix it? How do we fix the offense? Doug Peterson, if you remember, didn't really have an answer. He wanted to bring in a defensive coordinator, Matt Burke, I think, and he wanted to bring back um, Grow or whatever it was. Like his answer wasn't sufficient. And if Nick Sirianni doesn't have a good answer, and you don't believe that him coming back is going to change things, like some owners would say, "Hey, he just had me in the Super Bowl. I have to give him at least another year. We were ten and one. There were some injuries. I have to give him another year." Jeffrey Lurie's not a knee-jerk, re- knee-jerk reaction guy to where he just fires the fire. But if he believes next year it's not going to get better, and what he saw five of the last six games or what he saw the last half of this season is is more what this team is. And especially the other thing is conversations that are going to be had during exit interviews with Howie Roseman, maybe even with Jeffrey Lurie, guys that may not be back next year like Brandon Graham, like Fletcher Cox, like Jason Kelsey. I know if I'm Jeffrey Lurie, I'm having private conversations with these guys and saying, hey, what's going on? What's it? And if Nick Sirianni is deemed to be a problem because of the screaming and yelling at the fans or the immaturity or whatever the hell's going on with what's going on in that locker room right now, I don't think he's back. I, I don't think he's back. I mean, if, 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 if Nick Sirianni's not back next year, what exactly does he do that you can't replace, that you can't find out there? And that's the problem. Like, could the Eagles survive without Nick Sirianni? Yeah, because he's he's got no answers for anything right now. So, I mean, depending on how it goes down and depending what these veteran players have to say after this season is going to determine his future. It's crazy. You talk about him taunting the fans. And when they were winning, everybody loved that stuff. Well, a majority of people love that stuff. But when you're losing – that's going to get people turning on you real quick, man, because coaches don't act like that in the NFL. We it very, very rarely you ever see Andy Reid taunt 
the crowd? No way, man. You're not going to see that from coaches. And when Sirianni does it, it's great when you're winning football games. But the moment adversity comes into play, everyone's going to turn on you real fast. No, and, and like, you, of course, Andy Reid doesn't do it, but who does, right? Like, give me, I don't think give anybody. Me yeah. Rex Ryan. You have to go back to Rex Ryan for for a guy that 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 is kind of colorful, like Nick Sirianni. I like Nick, I really do. Um, I, I I thought he was effective as a leader, and guys played hard for him during his first two years, and they did right. Like I don't, we talked about adversity earlier, and I don't think they've really faced adversity until right now. But guys played hard for him; they played for him. Um, they're not playing for him right now. They're not playing hard for him right now. That team has been going through the motions. I remember after the – might have been after the Cowboys game where I remember watching watching the press conferences after the game, and these guys look like – they're like, man, are we not good enough? Are we – like, we they got, they got smashed two weeks in a row, and I feel like those two games, they lost all confidence in their ability, and the coaches have not been able to get them back, and the coaches are – the coaches may have lost confidence too, but <laughs> – Man, this is a mess. This is this is a historic collapse like nothing I've seen in my lifetime. You have to go back to the 64 Phillies. A lot of people are saying you're going back 60 years for a collapse like this. To go from 10 and 1 to where we are right now, talking about firing the coach now is um it's unexpected and it's crazy. I can't believe we are we're here where we are right now. Yeah, I think what? They're the only the second team ever with the 1986 Jets who won 10 out of their first 11 and didn't win the division. I mean, it really yep. is a historic collapse. First team, first team not to get the twelve wins, and they have the they had the benefit of the seventeenth win, the seventeenth game. They even had that extra game to try to get the twelve wins, and it's not like they. they I know they faced the gauntlet, but they won the first three games of the freaking gauntlet, and yeah, everybody just everybody signed up for oh well yeah we're gonna be we're gonna win those last four games and there's no problem and, uh, and you know what. Like, I don't know if the team believed that or what, but I don't think this team can beat anybody right now. So we'll see what happens on Monday. But this is this is as dire as I can remember this franchise. And that's what's really depressing me, John. I said it on my other show this morning on the Philly Sports Power Hour, that as much as it hurt when Super Bowl 57 ended last year on the holding penalty against James Bradbury, you found some solace in – well, they're going to get back really soon. They got a great franchise quarterback. They got a good young head coach. They have a great nucleus on this football team. We're going to get back. And now you sit here today and you look forward not only to this Monday against the Bucs, but we look forward maybe to next season or the year after. When is this team going to be a Super Bowl contender again? Because you just mentioned about probably no Jason Kelsey next year, no Brandon Graham, no Fletcher Cox. Who's the offensive coordinator? Who's the defensive coordinator? Who's your head coach? There's so many question marks now revolving around this team. You still don't have a linebacker. You still don't have safeties. Now you have a guy, Sidney Brown, who was promising, tears his Man. ACL. Man. A lot of question marks, John, that's got me depressed because I don't know when this team is going to be a contender again. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder A.J. Brown, his happiness, and is he going to demand a new contract this offseason because he was putting up big numbers, and obviously he he was on pace for almost 2,000 yards at one point. That has changed. Demonte Smith's going to need a new contract, right? Like, all of a sudden, it goes from best roster, man, we can draft, look at the draft picks, look at the free agent signings, like everything we touch turns to gold, Nick Sirianni, Jalen Hurts. And like that, now you're questioning everything. So it is – Let's see what happens in the game on Monday night. But this is going to be a uh, this is going to be an uncomfortable off season. And man, like to to think that Nick Sirianni's job could be on the line based on what happens on Monday, it's crazy to think right now. But I think it's reality. And one player you didn't mention, you said the best player on the defense is Hassan Reddick. He's probably going to want a new deal because he's not going to want to play with only one year left on that three year deal he signed last year. So. A lot of yep. question marks. A lot of question marks. Well, Johnny, I appreciate you joining the show, my man. I see people in the chat wanting to know why you left the WIP. He, John did a whole announcement about it. You could check it out on his Instagram Google page. It. But yeah, yeah, Google it. Google it. It's everywhere. But I, so, I mean, I, I had a, a really good opportunity with DoorDash to, uh, to, the, to deliver everybody's lunch and dinner. So I couldn't pass it up. So I had to tell the Marks and Reese show that, uh, that I could no longer do both things, DoorDash. 
uh, NWIP. But yeah, just Google it. Um, it just it was it was uh, a decision that I made going forward that uh, that I felt like was best for my quality of life. And uh, I love Ike and Jack and WIP and everything else. But Google it. You'll see video and you'll see uh, an interview on Crossing Broad where I kind of get into more of the details. But all good. And uh, I hope to be back. I love coming on with you, Bill. But I hope to be back doing something uh, as soon as I can. Awesome, John. Well, I'm looking forward to it, man. I appreciate you making time for us tonight, my brother. Anytime, man. Love coming on with you. Thank you. I right, get back to your family. My man, Johnny Marks, joining the Legal Hands to the Face show. Always good talking to John. I know you guys are happy to hear Johnny's voice again talking Eagles. I wish it was uh, under better circumstances. I wish we had John on talking about all the positive things with this Philadelphia Eagles football team. But unfortunately, that is just not reality right now. But guys, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, I want to turn our focus to this wild card game, because it's amazing. There is, in fact, a playoff game in in Tampa on Monday night. So we'll talk about that. We'll take a little look around the NFL, some other playoff matchups as well. And don't forget, like we end every legal hands to the face show with a little Philadelphia Eagles trivia. So hit that like button, guys. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Go to get.